we, we had a big conference room. I think there was about 25 people in the firm at that point. And so Kathy on the weekly uh, meeting said, okay, you know, we got this um, job uh, for San Francisco Day School. They'd done the renovation. Now we got to get started on the D DD and CDs for this. And we need somebody to manage this job. And I looked around the room and everybody was ducking. I mean, everybody was head down, no eye contact. I raised my hand. So I'll do it. Had no clue. I'd never done a school, never managed a project in my life. That was the last project I ever worked on that wasn't a school. Always volunteer to do something you don't know how to do. That made my whole career. All right, so the very first question, if you want to just jump into it, is sure. can you tell me just a little bit about yourself and your background? Um, I'm the principal, founding principal of Studio Bondi Architecture, and we're based in Oakland, and we do mainly um, pre-K through 12th grade educational work and, and commercial work, some commercial work, and, um, and we've been in business since about 2001. <clears throat> I grew up in, in the deep south, uh, uh, coastal southern states, and graduated from high school in 1968. Um, which was, as you might, you probably don't remember, but some might remember that that was sort of a uh, beginning of the, of the escalation of the Vietnam conflict. And um, so I ended up going into a uh, uh, electrical engineering program at Georgia Tech in ROTC and got a degree in electrical engineering and, and then spent four and a half years as a Naval officer. And it was during my time in the Navy that I uh, uh, met a few people uh, during while I was in the Navy, not Navy people, but uh, others, painters and artists, um, who I started getting more, more of an interest in the creative arts and uh, felt like uh, I was much more inclined to go that direction. Uh, ended up going to applying and getting into Cal Poly um, and started all over again as an undergraduate freshman at Cal Poly uh, in architecture. And, um, and did that. And uh, then I came to San Francisco after that and started working for um, a small firm, uh, a very, very good, respected uh, residential, small commercial firm, Lanier Cheryl Morrison. Uh, Al Lanier, who was my sort of direct boss there, was married to Ruth Asawa. I don't know if you know who she is. She's a very well known San Francisco artist. The Ruth Asawa. School of the Arts, High School for the Arts is named after her. Okay. Um, and, and she and Albert uh, were both came out of Black Mountain College, which was sort of the Bauhaus of, of, the, of the states after World War II. Uh, and most of the, many of the teachers there came from the Bauhaus in, in Germany. So it was a, it was a he, he had a very good, uh, almost minimalist approach to buildings, uh, not super high styled and, um, I worked there for five years and then uh, went to Kathy Simon's office, which was then known as F. Simon Martin Beggy, Winklestein and Morris, and was there for 15 years where I uh, uh, ran the education studio, the K-12 education studio, and then uh, started my office with uh, a guy from that, from Kathy's office, Fred Starkweather in 2001. And we were originally were Starkweather Bondi and then Fred retired and about 2015, and we became uh, Studio Bondi and uh, ah. do education work. So I've only had three jobs in architecture. <laughs> I love it. So you have so you have two bachelor's degrees in electrical engineering and in architecture, with with a stint in the Navy between right. those, right? And then um, three jobs in architecture, including. Yeah, I've only know. used my resume twice. <laughs> That's great. Once coming out of school and once when I went to Kathy's, that was it. I just uh, stayed with Kathy the whole, all that time and built the, <clears throat> my relationship with the, the clients in education. So when she decided to move offices and she, she was more interested in, interested in doing larger commercial works. We did the, uh, with Paycoff Free, did the addition of the main, did the new main library and the ferry building renovation and some mm -hmm. other large projects there, but I was running the school's projects. And so she, she wanted to continue doing the larger projects and 
I so with her agreement, I took off and took all the clients with me, except for one, all the school clients, and uh, have been uh, so I had a good base to start with. It's just anybody who's trying to start an office, you got to have work. This yeah. is really really hard to uh, expect you're just going to get work because you put your shingle up. It's relationship yeah. that uh, you have to have. I, you know, uh, 2018, I think I worked with about a hundred architects and engineers to get them started on their own firms. Uh, these are, these are folks that were peeling off from larger firms. The economy was great and they, they hung a shingle and went out on their own. And of those hundred firms, I don't know what percentage it is, but a high percentage of them are out of business at this point, two plus years later. And it, it kind of started a really interesting question for me, which was like, what, what do good firms do well? Where where are people, you know, maybe missing something? Because I I don't doubt whether those designers are amazing, right? These design professionals are really good at what they do, but to your point, it, they didn't have the revenue. They didn't have the consistent revenue. Maybe, maybe they had a project or two that they went out on their own with, and that was enough to keep them busy. But um, yeah. Yeah. well, it's important to keep yourself happy doing the kind of work you like. But uh, if you want to stay in business, you have to keep your clients happy. Right, right. Uh, uh, you, you, have, you have to accommodate people to a, to a certain degree. And um, sooner or later, um, you're going to come around. The, uh, up, it, you're going to be meeting those people again in your career. So not burning bridges is, I would say, one of the essential things. Um, it, it's amazing how many people will show up 10, 15 years later and say, oh, you know, I, I was talking to so-and-so and thought maybe you, you guys would like to take a look at this or do that. If, if you have an unhappy client, it's going to follow you around because people are going to call them. And, and But if you have a happy client, that not only are they going to give you a good recommendation, they're also going to recommend you for work, um, uh, which has happened to us. And that doesn't go just for clients. Like we've had uh, at least two or three jobs that contractors have brought us in on. The one right behind you, we did with DevCon construction, behind me, right? not you, uh, uh, with DevCon, which is a theater for the Harker School in San Jose. And um, they they enjoyed working with us and we were, we were connected with uh, um, collaborating with Kevin Hart, uh, who's a, who, I'll give you that story in a second, um, uh, is another great architect and, um, you know, when Bishop O'Dowd High School decided they wanted to do their gym, they asked DEFCON to come in and see, give them a price and do it, design, build, and, and they just brought us on the team. We didn't even have to lift a finger. That's awesome. You know, we, we yeah. got, that was our job. And, um, and quite honestly, the relationship there is exactly the same as the one we had uh, here, which was a good job. So. That, that, so you, especially because you started in electrical engineering and then switched after the Navy to architecture, what was it that drew you to architecture and made you want to become an architect? Well, I wasn't that enamored of electrical engineering as it turned out. I did okay at the, in school, but um, um, during, during the, at that time, if you were in school, you had to stay in school. Or you, or you got drafted. There was no, at least where I was, which was in, in Georgia, um, there was no anti-war movement at all, at all, period. Um, and there was just, you know, people were looking for ways to beat the draft, but not to dodge it so much. Um, and so since I was already in, in uh, engineering, I couldn't get out. Uh, so I had to complete the study and because I was already obligated to go into the Navy at the completion of the degree. So I, I, I got through it, uh, but probably by my junior year at Georgia Tech and certainly once I was in the Navy, I knew I needed to find something else to do. And I, I really uh, just wanted it to be something in the creative arts of some kind and having an engineering and mathematics math background, I knew I could do architecture from a technical standpoint, you know, intellectually. I had no clue whether I could draw anything. I'd never had an art class until I got to Georgia Tech. I'd never had an art class ever since elementary school or music <laughs> or anything in any way related. Um, but fortunately, the guy that interviewed me for Cal Poly was a Navy vet. 
<laughs> World War II. And he was also a geotechnical engineer, not an architect. So I, I was able to BS my way through the interview. <laughs> you know, I was, I think I did one of these with Mark Cavaniero uh, a few weeks ago. And he, I think he studied history <clears throat> undergrad at Harvard. And, and said basically what you just said, which is I had very little experience drawing. I am not an artist. <laughs> it didn't stop him from becoming an architect, right? A great architect, but um, that's good to hear. I think I think that's good for for students to hear, which is you know don't don't let that be the reason if right. if you're something you're on interested. The, on in. the other hand, I would recommend to any student that they get a uh, pad of paper and draw every day. Uh, everything they can as, often, as much as they can. Yeah. Uh, I know kids today are more inclined to do uh, computer drawings, but there, I don't think there's any substitute for the kind of hand-eye coordination for learning how to look at things and, and see things. So Yeah. So that's actually an interesting question that we were going to get to, but let's just hop into it, which is when you're, if you're hiring somebody for your firm, and they're they're a young designer, whether they're coming through the architectural foundation um, or maybe just finished their bachelor's degree. Are you looking for uh, like CAD experience, like Revit type stuff, or are you are you looking for something different with, as far well, as their experience? Well, we're not looking for that experience. We we can't hire anybody that doesn't have that experience. Okay, got it. I mean, so that's sort of the baseline requirements. It's like, can you breathe? Um, you know, type thing. Uh, but so everybody we interview has already sort of passed that mark that, that they know how to do Revit or uh, in this case, nowadays Revit is generally, it was just AutoCAD, but, um, and uh, so after, beyond that, then, then we're, we're looking at everything, you know, we're looking like experience, um, you know, really uh, that's related to the job we're looking for them to do. Um, personality is, is it, do they seem like somebody we'd like to uh, work with because quite frankly, you spend more time with the people you work with than you do with anybody else in your life. And so you want them to be somebody who at least seems to be um, compatible. Usually we're pretty good at that. We've had a few uh, cases where things popped up that, that didn't work out too well. Um, and um and then you can just sort of tell by the way people talk and what you're looking at if they have any sort of creative drive. And uh, um, and so that 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 would be the other thing is, you know, and and we're not specifically looking for great designers all the time. I mean, matter of fact, I would say more often than not, we'd like somebody who's got good technical skills because that's who we need to do the drawings. But um, we've now have several people in our office or quite a few people in our office that are, are great technical skills and are good designers. And those, those are the people who we really like working with. Um, what has been the hardest part of your journey so far? Besides this interview? <laughs> yes. <laughs> The hardest part is uh, is being being a man, you know, a, a partner, and having responsibility. And I say hard, and it's in a different sense. It's not like roofing or or digging uh, trenches or something like that. Uh, but is you know, when when you when you have your own firm or you're a senior manager, you wow. you suddenly not only have the architecture, but you have the responsibility for the the people who are working with you for not just for their careers, but in, so, in many ways, uh, you're having a, a great effect on their day, daily life and their, you know, what they're doing. And so you worry about work, not just because you want to be able to do architecture, but you worry about it because you want to keep your firm open and you want to keep your firm open because you have a responsibility to your employees and want to make sure that, that, that you can give them work. So, I mean, there's other factors, but, um, I would say, you know, that's that's the the that's the part which is is the most concentrated uh, uh, area where you, you worry about things. I, it's sort of like the ocean. I mean, it's, it's, it, it it can be calm one day and it can be really stormy the next day, and you just have to be prepared uh, to keep the ship afloat in no matter which kind of weather you're in. And sometimes it's it's pretty hectic and, and stressful um, uh, if. If, if 
I mean, it can go either way. You either have too many people and suddenly a job stops and you don't know what to do with the people and you don't want to let them go. And so you have to make a decision about how to, how to redistribute your workforce or you, you need some more work and you get it, but you don't really have the person, the best person to work on there. So you have to have to bridge the project until you can get something going. So it's, 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 and that is a constant uh, back and forth between being overstaffed and understaffed and uh, too much work and too little work. Right. Um, right. That business side of architecture. It's the stuff they don't teach you in school. Huh? Right. Well, yeah, none of that. Yeah. Uh, but um, they, they also, I don't really think they do teach a lot about, uh, you know, selling your, your ideas in school. Mm-hmm. And by selling, I don't mean just like convincing somebody you're you're smart and a good designer, but um, this whole idea of bringing people along with you as as uh, as part of the process, uh, it, to me, has been the, sort of the key to our success. We want the client to feel like they were as big a part of how the building turned out as you 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 were. You say is your favorite part of your job. Actually, the favorite part of my job, you know, is because we do schools, mainly. Um, probably have, I counted it up a couple of years ago, but I think something like over 20,000 kids a day in schools that I've worked on right now. Um, uh, uh, and so the favorite part is when the project opens and you see the kids using it. That's really the best. Yeah. You know, the That's, opening day or, or, or you go back for, to checks and you see the kids playing and, and, you know, and, and enjoying it and uh, hanging out in the hallway. Like the, the picture that's behind me where those two women are standing up there on the, on the balcony, um, that that's a hallway that goes the length of the building. We went out there for some reason after the job opened and the entire hallway for, it's about a hundred feet long, maybe 80 feet long. Um, was kids strewn along, uh, sitting on against the wall, looking out. It's all glass on one side, and it just had become the hangout. Those are the serendipitous moments that you kind of like the best. Yeah, right. You need to see yeah. the spaces that you've created being used for what they were intended for. Right. Or, or yeah, or like if you're doing residential, which I've done a fair amount of that, to see somebody, you know. Uh, have somebody invite you over and cook you a meal in the in the new kitchen, or or come over for a drink or something, and uh, and it's how much they, they've enjoyed it and it's changed your life. So, That's awesome. Yeah, That's really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, can you? I mean, we already touched on this a little bit, but can you describe the process behind opening your own practice and kind of what that looked like? Well, and, and, well, it, you know, first of all, you need capitalization money um mm-hmm. to, to get set up unless you're going to just be a, a sole practitioner out of your house you know you, you need you need to lease a space you need to buy, get the equipment you have to anticipate your growth so you get the right size space and the number of workstations and um so there's a, a, so there's this whole opening uh, uh salvo of uh, things that have to get done just to, to function, internet, computers, plotters, all that kind of stuff. And uh, you can you can phase that in, of course. Um, and then you, you need to have some kind of work to do. Uh, I don't think you can just open a practice and just expect the work to come in. I mean, uh, I know I've had... Uh, friends who opened practices whose parents had contacts like in Hollywood or something like that. And they were able to do a few houses and get a reputation. And then they took off from there. Um, um, I, my two of my roommates from college, um, from Cal Poly, both terrific architects, actually there were three. Um, and uh, they all were teaching. And that's and and that's they they were relying on teaching at SciArc and Otis down in uh, LA, and in order to to support their practice, and and they 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 are sort of a very a very high design firm, who really only wanted to do jobs where they could they could uh, continue their design exploration explorations, 
And as a result, they stayed in business for many, many years, but with very few buildings, but a lot of, lot of publication mm. of pro- projects that they, they did competitions for or made up themselves and um, that, that sort of thing. So that's a completely different kind of practice. Mm-hmm. I want to build, I really like building things. So that's, the, that's, uh, that's sort of the direction I had it. Uh, and then, you know, you, you think you're on your way, but then the only way to get more work then is, is for people to invite you to come and interview. So that's, that's, that's where you get start getting nervous because like when we started out, we were competing against Mark Cavanero and Peter, 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 uh, Fowl and, uh, Bill Letty made him Stacy and, uh, all these people who'd been around for quite a long time and had, had, large volumes of work and you know so how, how you win one of those interviews is a lot of different factors but um, looking for strategies for for creating that work i would say in retrospect we've been really lucky that we were able to keep doing it with the school work but i you know if i were to give advice i'd say you need to diversify mm. and and find a number of different ways i think uh, Calvin Arrow certainly has done that. He's actually more de- on the, he's done a lot of school work, but that's not his bread and butter. And uh, Letty made him stay. He's very diverse. EHDD, another people, uh, another office we compete with and um, does uh, a lot of diverse work. I think we're bet maybe um, K2A, which is Steve Colm's office. He was a classmate. Um, they do mainly public school work, but he's the only other architect I know that does almost exclusively uh, K-12 education work. Um, is there a project that comes to mind that you are most proud of or most enjoyed working on or uh, just a client experience that you really, really enjoyed for whatever reason? What I really, really liked, boy. Well, I really liked the one I'm sitting in in the background here, yep. which was the one with uh, collaborating with Kevin Hart and um, uh, and uh, there's there's a beautiful to my I guess if you look at me to my left um, is the, is a, a beautiful state of the art theater with a big sixty foot fly, probably one of the nicest theaters in in the South Bay, and then across the plaza there is a brand new uh, double high school gymnasium, and um, it was just a really good relationship all the way through and, and uh, came out great. And uh, this was a job where they, they had enough money that whatever they wanted, they could, they, they would build it. Um, and uh, instead of having us to have to tell them, you know, we're not going to be able to afford that or, uh, you know, we're going to cut it back or basically we, there was very little of value engineering in this job. Um, right. Yeah. Is that more common? Is value engineering a little more common and, you know, uh, change orders and things like that to the tune of this is too expensive and we need to get it back under budget? Uh, well, yes. Um, I mean, I mean, we're, we're you're constantly doing it uh, up until the time you finally get your final pricing in. But even then, there's going to be um, uh, cost savings suggested by any contractor. Um, because that's the way it, lighting the for light the electrical contractors on a hundred percent of my jobs have come in with uh, alternate lighting packages. <laughs> I've never had a job that didn't have an alternate lighting package. Right. So there's you you're you're constantly doing that. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Just two more questions for you here. We'll kind of put these this, this one together. Um, who are some leaders in architecture, either peers or, or others that you admire and, or who are some people that have helped you along the way in your journey as well, an architect? Yeah, it's that, that one's actually pretty easy. Well, I'll start from the beginning. My roommate at Georgia tech and I used, he had a car, he was like, percent of the car and he loved to drive around Atlanta and look at buildings. And it never occurred to me to, to do that. With so that gave me the bug, so I give him credit for that. Okay. Then, uh, when I was in New Orleans, I was stationed in New Orleans for two years, um, and um, where I met a, a very very great painter called Jim Richard. He's still still down there, 
Uh, and um, it was my first introduction to somebody who's actually worked in the arts as a professional and, and really uh, had a sort of a different point of view of the world, which I recognized, but had not participated in until then. And then um, I had a, actually an art teacher at, at Cal Poly when I was in Europe and Italy called Mort Demonstein, who was a real inspiration to me because it was the first art, that was the first art class I'd ever had when I was a, 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 a senior at Cal Poly. Uh, I finally, after you know 25 years of school, got to take an art class. Um, but then coming up to the Bay Area, I'd say my first boss, Albert Lanier, uh, was very, uh, it still is, inspires me. Um, and then, um, and Kathy Simon, when I went on to uh, that office, um, not not just for design inspiration, but just for giving me the confidence to uh, take on and be responsible for these clients. And she really gave me a lot of responsibility and uh, and a lot of respect. So I appreciate that. Um, there was one guy at her office, Alan Stiles, who was one of their chief designers, who um, also took me under his wing, <clears throat> which um, um, really, really uh, was important to me. And then um, I would say, you know, Fred Starkweather, who my first partner, um, we would I would have never started the firm without him. It was his idea uh, in the beginning. I was ready to do it, but uh, he, he was, he, he was, uh, he had the fire to go out and, and do it. And, um, and then now, since then, my, my other three partners, um, I would say, um, we couldn't have continued on uh, as, as we are and without their help. And, and before they were partners as well, of course, but uh, right. So, yeah. Awesome. A lot, of, a lot of people. All right. Last question for you, Bill. Um, what is the best advice that you could give to an up and coming design professional? You never know enough. I can tell you that. And, and since you, you, you have to assume that you're in for the long haul and the, that it's going to take a long haul to learn it all. So you better start doing it. <laughs> And, 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 and be, I mean, there's a certain seriousness, even though you can have fun doing it, you know, um, I think you have to, it's, and, and that goes for not just technical things, but if you don't draw, if you don't design, even if you don't have a project, you, you're not going to, you got to keep the facility. It's like a muscle. You got to exercise it. And so you, you just, it's something you, that you do. It's your profession. So you, sort of need to do it 24 seven and, and, and to a certain degree, but uh, in architecture, you know, you, um, you know, you could work for 10 or 15 years before you do your own project that you've actually designed. You, you might get lucky and, you know, do it, do it right off the bat or who knows, but even once you start doing them, it can take two to five years or more for, uh, to get a single building built. And right. so you have the feedback loop until that happens. So how many do you need to, to do before you, you start feeling like you really know what you're doing? Right. And, uh, and I can tell you that uh, it's a leap of faith every time you do it uh, after all these years. I mean, you think you might know, but um, you just have to, it, it's gotten better because of Revit and, and 3D modeling and those sorts of things. But, you know, in my first office, Albert Lanier, out of his office, they did not do models at all. They did plans and elevations, and he he seemed to know what it was going to come out as. But it was for me, you know, it took a lot of experience to be able to uh, uh, spatially construct that um, just based off plan and elevation. And um, he didn't even do three D uh, perspectives. You know, the other advice I would give is always check yourself. Is 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 to uh, to be self-critical all the time, and not just from like putting yourself down or something like that, but that uh, assume that it might not be right always. Right, right. And That's hopefully it will be, but uh, you know, there 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 might be a better way to do it, or you might have failed to look around the corner to see that something else is happening on the other side of the building that you hadn't paid attention to. But um, that's the biggest mistake is um, 
I see with the young architects is wearing they're wearing blinders. And gotcha. they, they they think because it they could draw it, it's right. Gotcha. But, um, gotcha. Constantly try to get keep the bigger picture of the building. And um and and then the other uh, I've given more advice than than it's okay. say, uh, it's great. Always volunteer to do something you don't know how to do. Mm, that's a good one. That's, that's a really good one. That's the key. And then then learn how to do it before you have to turn turn your work in. <laughs> so just say yes and we'll figure it out. <laughs> let me let me I tell you it. how I got in, got into the school. Uh, the, I know we're going along, but this, no, how I got into doing school architecture is you know I, I went to Kathy's office. I'd been there for a little bit. Um, I think I worked on the UC Davis Library and some Sun Microsystems work um, for a while, and then um, w- Kathy's a Harvard graduate. GSA. She loved hiring people from the Ivy League schools, especially Harvard. And so um, there's a there's a there's a fairly high level of ego in the office. Let me say, and um, and expectations having gone to Harvard or whatever, what you're going to be doing. And um, so the San Francisco Day School, which is was a conversion of a Spanish. I said Italian Spanish mortuary over on Masonic and Golden Gate uh, was uh, um, getting ready to move into their school and they needed an architect to do the addition to the school and and some more renovation. And um, it had already been designed for the most part and um, in a, in a sort of mock ersatz Spanish Italian style to match to mimic the ersatz Italian style, <laughs> so already there, and um, so not not a, not a uh, a plum design job as it was, but um, so we had a big conference room. I think there was about twenty five people in the firm at that point, and so Kathy on the weekly uh, meeting said, "Okay, you know, we got this um, job." Uh, for San Francisco Day School, they'd done the renovation. Now we got to get started on the D- DD and CDs for this, and we need somebody to manage this job. And I looked around the room, and everybody was ducking. I mean, everybody was head down, no eye contact. Look, didn't want to look at. I raised my hand, so I'll do it. Had no clue. I'd never done a school, never managed a project in my life. Well, not in, in architecture. Um, and uh, so I'll take it. And um, that was the last project I ever worked on that wasn't a school. <laughs> so you found it just like that. Well, I did a good job and we did a good job for it. And, you know, the thing which I didn't realize then, of course, I wasn't planning this, but those kids go to high school. And the same money that built that school had to build the high schools because their kids were going there. So from there, we got three high school jobs. You know, and I ran all, all those. And from there, I mean, it just branched out from that. But it was that one hand raise that made my whole career. That's awesome. That's yeah. a great story. Yeah, It's a really great story. Uh, Bill, thank you so much for taking the time to yeah. do this. Yeah. I uh, really, really appreciate it on, on behalf of the foundation. And uh, this is some great stories for our hey. students. So.